everyone. Welcome to episode number 634 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. This week, longtime friend of the show, Mike Walmsey from TE Connectivity, joins me to talk all about Vita 100. We're talking about the objectives of this new standard, why Vita 100 reflects a big leap forward for signal integrity, and where Vita 100 is headed in the future. Also this week, I check out new contact lenses that allow people to see in the dark, even with their eyes closed. So without further ado, please welcome Mike back to Fish Fry. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me. Glad to be here, Amelia. Okay, so you presented a session at ETT this year called A Giant Leap for Interconnect Next Gen Vita 100. So first, Mike, talk to me about how we got here. Where is VPX now compared to just a couple years ago? So today, the interconnect that's part of the VPX system really can support up to 25 to possibly 32 gigabits per second. There's been a lot of evolution over the last almost 20 years since VPX started in developing the connectors to bring higher speed protocols capable at the interface from the plug-in card to the backplane, and also it increases in ruggedness. So today we have a high-speed VPX connector in Vita 46.30, and it's our multi-gig RT3 connector, which was designed to support 25 gig lanes. So we can run 100 gig Ethernet over four channels within it, and in some cases run PCIe Gen 5 with some channel restrictions. But the mechanical interface, like over the years, has always been compatible. So all the pinouts have this been the same. You get the same number of differential pairs and signal pins in the same locations. So everything's been intermittable to date. So that's where we are now. Excellent. Now, Mike, what kind of goals or objectives are we looking at for this next generation of VPX connectors? Yeah, so the two main goals, I would say, as part of the next gen VPX were increasing data rates again because we know processors get faster and faster and signal speeds need to increase. And then the pin density was part of the issue too. So processors as they've gotten faster, they have more IO, uh, more pin count on them. So we have more signals that we need to get through the same relative amount of space. And we need to be able able to handle those protocols with higher data rates, like Ethernet, uh, 100 gig and a single channel, or 400 gig KR4, which is four channels of 100 gig. So we wanted to reach those higher speed protocols into a new connector. And really, it's a next generation connector because it can't be intermittable with what's developed in the past, the the existing ecosystem. We can build on it, but because we're trying to get more pins out of the interface, it's got to have a higher pin count, higher pin density. Uh, It's not going to have backward compatibility, but we're still trying to package it within the architecture of what VPX is today so that we look at common outlines of what the plug-in modules look like, what the cooling needs might be, you know, adapting it for wedge locks and certain board sizes that are standard today. But it's definitely a new generation of connector. So, Mike, what kind of solutions is TE offering in this arena? And what specific benefits are we looking at? So there's a Vita study group, 85.106, which was comprised of a number of industry leaders, a lot of contribution from those in the industry today to define what this next generation connector needs to do from electrical, mechanical, and environmental. And connector proposals were submitted to that group and TE was selected with their multi-gig HD product, which leverages a lot of the work that we've done to date on the VPX connector interface. So for instance, it's still got PCB wafers that carry the high-speed signals through the plug-in card connector, but there's also some significant changes. Those High-speed wafers are significantly different from what's available today. We use four-layer strip-line wafers to really isolate noise. We also have incorporated shields into the backplane connector between columns so that you minimize that noise from column to column. And then we've captured that higher pin density in how we route the signals and the size of the pads, the size of the contacts, getting a lot more 
pin content into the same amount of space. And one other introduction that's not in current VPX is that the power blades, the power wafers that are in the plug-in card connector are going to be a solid copper alloy rather than a PCB wafer-based solution. So we get twice the current density of today's solution. So we're bringing a lot of new higher speed, higher current, higher density into this new interface. So it's exciting. So Mike, we're looking at a big leap forward when it comes to signal integrity here, right? Yes, we are. And I think one of the things I talked about at the Embedded Tech Trends was when we look at signal integrity, you just can't look at a connector. You've got to look at how that fits within the channel, how the PCB routing is done and how that can degrade performance or how do you minimize the degradation of performance by routing signals out of the connector footprint to the processor or in through the backplane uh, from slot to slot. So we've run channel models, the Vita study group, 85.106, developed parameters for channel studies. And we've developed channel models that took the connectors, two sets of connectors, went from a transmit on a plug-in card into the backplane, out another slot in the backplane into another plug-in card with the receiver. Based on those parameters, we looked at the signaling and how it supported Ethernet and, and PCIe protocols. And we kept using that to optimize the design. So we've shown over you know, multiple different channel lengths, how it can perform and how it uh, minimizes noise over the current solution today. So it's a big leap in performance over multi-gig RT3 or anything on the market today for VPX. It's not just an enhancement. All right. So Mike, where is this solution headed in the future? So we're getting ready to build production tooling at this point. We've already built and tested prototypes and we're kicking off tooling to do two different variations. One's a four pair solution, which is supports one inch pitch, one inch VPX slot pitch today. So that's a four pair. It's got four differential pair in a, in a single ended contact on each wafer. And then we're also doing a six pair version. So six pair is going to be taller, deeper into the card, uh, but that fits a nice need for high density switches, for example, where that IO, that pin count we talked about is really critical and requires a 1.2 inch slot. So it takes up a little bit more space in the chassis because the slot pitch increases because of the connector size, but you get more signals through it. So we're doing those two variations of it. We're also tooling up options to put AC coupling capacitors on the connector wafers themselves. So typically the AC coupling capacitors would be on the plug-in card behind the connector, but if we can bring them and integrate them into the connector package, that frees up board space for the card designer and uh, increases the signal integrity as well. That's an interesting new um, option that we're adding with the next-gen solution. Fantastic. All right, Mike, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. So, Mike, if you could have a meal right now with one person, alive or dead, who would it be? So I think if I had a meal with somebody, somebody very interesting would be Julia Louis-Dreyfus. She's just, I think she's just hilarious. Her career has been fantastic. Just got a lot of admiration for all the work that she's done. It would be an interesting dinner conversation. I love that answer. Well, Mike, as always, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. If you had to pick a superpower, what would you choose? Invincibility? Flight? Maybe seeing with your eyes closed? Well, folks, that last one may be closer at hand than we know. Get this, a team of researchers at the University of Science and Technology of China have created contact lenses that enable infrared vision in both humans and mice by converting infrared light into visible light. I don't know if you've messed around with those infrared night vision goggles before, but they can be pretty neat. One time, I watched salmon in the Rogue River in southern Oregon using those night vision goggles. It was super cool. So, unlike those glasses, these new contact lenses, which were recently described in the press journal called Cell last week, do not need any kind of power source. These contact lenses allow the people wearing them to perceive multiple infrared wavelengths. And because they are transparent, wearers can see both 
visible and infrared light at the same time. And their infrared vision is actually enhanced when the wearers have their eyes closed. Okay, so this is how these contact lenses work. They use nanoparticles that absorb infrared light and then convert it into wavelengths that are visible to mammalian eyes, which are electromagnetic radiation in the 400 to 700 nanometer range. Now, these nanoparticles are especially important to this technology because they enable the detection of near-infrared light, which is infrared light in the 800 to 1600 nanometer range, just beyond what humans can already see. In previous research, this team actually injected these nanoparticles into the retina of mice to enable this kind of infrared vision. But in order to develop a much less invasive option, they developed these contact lenses by combining the nanoparticles with flexible, non-toxic polymers, which are used in standard soft contact lenses. After confirming that these contact lenses were non-toxic, they tested their function in both mice and humans. So, in the research trials with mice, this team found that the mice wearing these contact lenses did display behaviors that suggested they could see infrared wavelengths. For example, when the mice were given the choice of a dark box and an infrared illuminated box, the contact wearing mice chose the dark box whereas the contact-less mice showed no preference. These mice also showed physiological signs of infrared vision, and images of their brains showed that infrared light caused their visual processing centers to light up and their pupils constricted in the presence of infrared light. In the human trials, participants were able to accurately detect flashing signals and perceive the direction of incoming infrared light while wearing these unique contact lenses. Another cool addition to these lenses allowed people wearing them to differentiate between various spectra of infrared light. This team did this by engineering the nanoparticles to color code different infrared wavelengths. This addition allowed wearers to perceive a more detailed infrared spectrum, and these color-coded nanoparticles could also be modified to help colorblind people see wavelengths that they would otherwise be unable to detect. The senior author of the associated research paper, a neuroscientist at the University of Science and Technology of China, explains their groundbreaking research like this. It's totally clear cut. Without the contact lenses, the subject cannot see anything. But when they put them on, they can clearly see the flickering of the infrared light. We also found that when the subject closes their eyes, they're even better able to perceive this flickering information. Because near-infrared light penetrates the eyelid more effectively than visible light, so there is less interference from visible light. So, this research isn't perfect yet because these contact lenses have a limited ability to capture fine details because they are so close to the retina, which causes converted light particles to scatter. This team also developed a wearable glass system using the same nanoparticle technology, which allows users to perceive higher resolution infrared information. Also, these lenses are now only able to detect infrared radiation projected from an LED light source. But the researchers are working on 
ways to increase the nanoparticle sensitivity so they can detect lower levels of infrared light. In the future, this team is also looking to collaborate with optical experts and material scientists to make sure their contact lenses have more precise spatial resolution and a higher sensitivity. This team sums up their research like this. Our research opens up the potential for non-invasive wearable devices to give people supervision. There are many potential applications right away for this material. For example, flickering infrared light could be used to transmit information in security, rescue, encryption, or anti-counterfeiting settings. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about this study, more information about Vita 100 or TE connectivity, I've included a bunch of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal if LinkedIn is more your thing. I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 30th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>